zero zero plus beta star times one zero minus zero zero. And then you have H, which is a G S1 plus S2 squared. So I'm going to pull the G out here, and then I'm going to have, I'm just going to call it S squared. And now it's alpha times one zero plus zero zero plus beta times one zero minus zero zero. Okay, so that's the expression. Now you see that, of course, where shall I write this? Maybe I'll write it over here. S squared on one zero is H bar squared times one one plus one. One zero, so that's two H bar squared on zero. On the other hand, S squared on zero zero is just zero, because the spin is zero. It would be H bar squared zero times zero plus one, which is zero. So what happens over here is we get G over two alpha star one zero plus zero zero plus beta star one zero minus zero zero. And then this acts in here to give us two H bar squared alpha one zero plus two H bar squared beta one zero. And now the one zero states are orthogonal to the zero zero states. If we pull out the factors of the two H bar squared and the G over two, we get G H bar squared. And the bottom one, the top one then is alpha star one zero plus beta star one zero, because the, and the bottom one is alpha plus beta one zero. This is because the one, we can forget about the zero zero states because they're orthogonal to the one zero states. And then recombining this, this just gives us G H bar squared alpha plus beta squared times one zero, one zero. Because this can be rewritten as alpha star plus beta star times one zero, and this is alpha plus beta one zero. So the final answer is just G H bar squared alpha plus beta squared. So you see the energy depends upon the values you pick for the complex numbers alpha and beta in this spectrum of states that are called exchange degenerate. And of course we know which state is the physical state. The physical state is the one that satisfies our criterion here that the states that you should have a symmetric combination if the spin is one half, three halves, et cetera, in general, two and plus one over two H bar. I'm sorry, minus. And these things are called fermions. And then on the other hand, if they're bosons, then it should be plus minus, plus minus plus for the spin and H bar, where in both cases it is an integer. So in this particular example, then, the physical state, psi physical, 
is in 1 over root 2, plus, minus, 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 plus. In other words, beta is equal to minus alpha is equal to 1 over, minus 1 over root 2. And you notice for that case, the value of the energy, the mean value of the energy, in fact, the value of the energy is zero. In fact, it's an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian now, because this is the state of, this is the state of 0, 0. And so H on 0, 0, which is H on psi physical, is just zero. So I thought this was a somewhat better example than the one where you had to measure the x component of both spins, which I didn't have when I did my slide. So are there any questions about this? Relevant to this. Or irrelevant. The strange thing about this issue of identical particles is that the rule that comes out, this rule here, is so simple that when I teach physics 102, I explain this rule in detail. I don't try to justify it, but I certainly explain the rule. And of course, it has many, many implications. So let me, again, point out that you can actually start with the state psi 0 equals plus minus. And then you can act on psi 0 with a physical operator, e to the minus the total spin dot x hat, rotation by pi, and then divide by h bar, and act on that on the state plus minus. And this then will be e to the minus i. The h bars will cancel with that sigma 1 plus sigma 2. Now, though, pi over 2. And it will be the x component in each case. So sigma 1x, sigma 2x on plus minus. And as you know, e to the minus i sigma x pi over 2 is cosine pi over 2 plus i sine minus pi over 2. Minus pi over 2. So sigma x. And so this is just minus i sigma x. And so what this does is this gives you minus i sigma x on plus, say, sigma x1. And minus i sigma x2 on minus. And as you know, sigma x looks like this. So sigma x plus is minus. And sigma x minus is plus. And so this just gives you minus twice minus i squared times minus plus. And so, in other words, the physical state is just the state to start with plus a physical rotation dot x hat over h bar on plus minus. And this gives you then plus minus 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 plus, which is a physical combination. And of course, you have to normalize it. So let's see what we do. As I said, in all the examples I've looked at, 
this rule actually worked. Okay, so now we want to see some various applications. And let's see. One, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let me go back to the case of Adams that we were talking about when we did perturbation here. The Hamiltonian for the atom is going to be the sum, say, J equals 1 to Z of J squared over 2ME. One thing I probably forgot to mention over here when I said that this Hamiltonian was symmetric under the interchange of origins of labels, of course, there's no need to put a 1 here and a 2 there because the particles are identical, so they have the same mass. Similarly, over here, because all the electrons are identical, it's the same mass. And then there's going to be minus, if we want, we can say NKS equals Q squared over 4 pi epsilon 0, sum J equals 1 to Z. Then we have the Z here and 1 over RJ. So that's the interaction of each of the electrons with the nucleus. And then the next term, the term that's really quite hard, is a sum over J, let us say J less than K, and then it would again be Q squared, and this would be a plus sign over 4 pi epsilon 0, 1 over RJ minus RK. Okay, so this would be the full Hamiltonian, and we'd go up again to Z. And you can see that this would be a terribly difficult problem to solve in quantum mechanics, in fact, even classical mechanics, but certainly quantum mechanics. And so what one does is this central field approximation, which I think is quite cute. So you see what you could do, one possibility, or the first thing that would occur when solving it, would be to say that H0 is just the sum of Pj squared over 2 meromy, polyvolte, minus Zq squared, 1 over RJ. You might say that this is H0, and then you might say V then is this thing, and of course this thing is actually, you remember the identity of the units, the one thing that saves us from going completely mad with these different systems of units, that this is E squared, where the E squared is the E squared of, the E squared is this, the E squared over H bar C is 1 over I bar 37. So anyway, so we might write this thing as simply E squared sum of J less than K, 1 over RJ minus RK. So you might think, well, that's the right way to separate things out, but this is really a mistake, because this perturbation is much bigger than it need be, and I mean, the advantage of doing it this way, though, is that you can solve all these guys. These guys would all put the electrons in really close to the nucleus, and then this perturbation would spread them out again, and it would be kind of, it would be easy to do, but it would be a very bad approximation, because you know the electrons aren't all clustered near the nucleus. They're spread out because one electron screens another because of this repulsive interaction. So what you do, and this is, I 
I'm not an expert in this. This is um, something that I think is more art, is, is more art than science. You keep the kinetic part of art. And then you put in um, minus uh, V central at R J. So this is my sum. And let me just write this. Okay. And this 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 V central of R J is really a uh, symmetric. Let's just say V central of R J is V central of the length of R J. And then you have as your as your uh, perturbation V, you first of all put back this thing, and so I'll write this as minus E squared sum 1 over R J J 1 to Z. So I'm putting this back in. Then I'm taking out this one. So I put it in. And this is just the length of that. I shouldn't really have done this. I should have made this just the length of RJ. BC RJ. So you, you put in these terms. So that puts back in this one and and. Actually, if I've done it, okay, this is this. I'm screwing this up just a little bit. Okay. Sorry, I'm doing this without the notes here. So this is um, the attract, you put back in the attractive term and you cancel the thing that you put in. And now you put in the hard term. Okay. So now this is your perturbation. And um, what you do here is you put in your best guess as to what the physical screened sort of a mean field approximation is. And if you think about it, you'd see that the physical potential is is going to look like it's going to look like um, minus z e squared over r for small r. On the other hand, it, let's suppose that one then goes like this. On the other hand, it's going to look like this one, which is minus e squared over r for big r. And in between, it's going to interpolate between the two. So your, your, your v central then is going to do something like well, let's see, this is not right. Yeah, B central is going, to, is going to essentially do this, and the, the, the one that I... So this is... Well, you don't need to do this. This one is minus E squared of R, and this one here is going to be B central of R. Okay? So, and how do you do that is a matter of um, a matter of both art and science. Um, but when you do that, then you get as your ground state the eigenfunctions of this of this Hamiltonian, which put the uh, put the the electrons in suitable shells, and then you uh, use this as your perturbation. And of course, since they're electrons, then the, the thing has to be totally uh, anti-symmetric. And um, one way of making things totally anti-symmetric is to use something called the Slater determinant. And um, so.
So the idea that inside of the X plane, the X plane, the X plane, the X plane, is a suitable normalization factor, we'll call it C, and you have determinant, and you have, say, phi 1 of X1, phi 2 of X1, phi of X1, phi N of X1, and then down here you have phi 1 of phi 2, so that's phi 2 of X, that was back, well, I'm doing that one now, this is the X, so this should be X2, and this is phi 1 of phi 2, phi N of X2, and then down here phi 1 of XN, phi 2 of XN, phi N of XN. Okay, so that's your, that's the state of the determinant, and these things should involve spin as well as space indices. Okay, so let me, let me see in this, I just want to get a picture of, okay, so here's a picture of how these things work out. So, of course, way down in the bottom we're going to have 1S, and it will have two electrons in it, and then higher up we'll have a 2S level, which can have two electrons in it, and then somewhat higher, a 2P level with six, and of course the 2P is higher than the 2S because it gets away from the origin more than the 2S, and so down here in this 1S level we're talking hydrogen and helium. Up here for the 2S level we're talking lithium and beryllium. Up in the 2P level we've got boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. What is meant here is that the highest energy electrons are in the 2P level in these atoms, and then we have a 3S level with two states, and so this is sodium and magnesium, and then 3P, again six, and we've got aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon, and then things get quite tricky. We've got a 4S with two, and then curiously a 3D with ten, and then a 4P with six, and this group is, this one is potassium and calcium, and then the 3D, so the 3D group is, I guess, scandium, God, I don't even know what these names are, TLA, B, there's chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. Well, I think I'll quit here because I'm not tall enough to continue, but you see what basically the, you see the picture gets more complicated. I have a notational question. I'm trying to find the Z 
that's up there matching the Z over here, and I don't find the Z in, this, in the following. It's a Z here. Is that what you mean? No, 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 no. It's a coefficient of Z at the top of your Hamiltonian at the top. There's a Z in front oh, of the Oh, there should be a Z here. Okay. Is that it? Thank you. That's good. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Um, now, of course, these identical particles are, as I said, it's very important to have. Um, well, let me, let me just mention a few, uh, some of the low hanging fruit here for identical particles. Um, first of all, I just want to say something that's qualitative.
right. Well, suppose. So anyway, so identical particles then are is an important concept that has huge physical implications. It governs the structure of atoms. It determines the cell shell structure of atoms, as we've seen here. It also determines the shell structure of nuclei. And back in the 70s, it was one of the reasons why people suspected that there was another quantum number involved in force, namely that there was a particle called delta plus plus. And it seemed to be then three up quarks. And since it was the ground state of this resonance, it was they were all thought to be in S space. And these each would have charge two thirds, two thirds of the charge of the proton, say. And so all together, three times two thirds is plus two. That's why it's delta plus plus. They're in an S state. And moreover, the spin was three halves. So if they're in an S state, then they all had to be spin up. So it had to be U quark, spin up, S state, U quark, spin up, S state, U quark, spin up, S state. And that looked like a violation of spin and statistics. And so what people said was, aha, there's a third quantum number of color. And so, in fact, this guy is red, this guy is blue, and this guy is semi-green. And then one has the possibility of having a totally, when you make it totally anti-symmetric. OK. So identical particles, this concept of identical particles occurs all over. And as I said, low temperature, the things of boson, you have Einstein condensation. All the particles want to go into the ground state. If you have fermions, on the other hand, you can only put one particle in each state. And of course, because it's often true that the Hamiltonian doesn't involve spin. If it doesn't involve spin, then you have two possible spin states. And so if you have n particles and you have a fermion, then you put your total energy is E1 for the lowest state, plus E2, plus E3, plus dot, 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 plus En. And this highest energy, then, is called the fermion energy. And if you want to put another particle in, it's got to go in to En plus 1. And so, as I said, if spin is not an issue, then E1 might equal E2, and E3 might equal E4, and so forth. On the other hand, for bosons, and this is the ground state, I should mention. This is the ground state of the system for fermions. For bosons, on the other hand, ground state is E1, E equals N, E1, everybody in the ground state. So, because there are many, many other applications, we could probably spend the rest of the semester on identical particles. But I think if you want to just see a few more examples, and there's a lot of other things. There are cases, though, when the identical part, when you don't need to take into account the fact that the particles are identical. And this is when, for example, you're doing an experiment here in region A, and then you're doing another experiment here 
So somebody else is doing an experiment in region B. And so you have here psi of x is 90 to 0 for x in region A. And then pi of y, maybe I should say pi of x, pi of x is not equal to 0 only if x is in region B. And in this case, then, your, let me call this phi instead of, I'll call it phi and pi. So then psi of x1 and x2, you might start out by writing this on normalization factor. Phi of x1, phi of x2, plus or minus phi of x2, phi of x1. So you might start writing it, say, that way. But then, if in fact x1 is always, if x1 is always in region A, and if x2 is always in region B, for the simple reason that x1, say, is an experiment in slack, and x2 is an experiment in Argonne or Fermilab, then you don't expect them to interfere. And in that case, in fact, the first term would be non-zero, but the second term would be strictly zero, because phi, when x2 is in, say, Illinois, the phi is zero, and when x1 is in California, chi is zero. And so the interference term goes away when the particles don't overlap, because they're in different experiments. Of course, that's pretty important, although if it weren't the case, we simply go crazy. We'd have to know about all the electrons in a different galaxy before getting anything right on any experiments at all. All right. Now let me, before going to helium, which is what I want to do next, the helium atom, let's do something called the variational method. Let's describe the variational method. This is a very simple, very versatile, and at times very powerful idea, although it doesn't always work. In fact, Feynman runs for a paper on how badly the variational method can fail for a quantum field theory. Okay, so first of all, it's clear that what's the variational principle good for? The variational principle and variational method is good for finding, is a way to find the ground state of a system. And it's pretty clear that just from its nature, the ground state is the state of lowest energy, so it's pretty obvious. Suppose now psi of alpha 
or let me just call it psi. Suppose psi is some approximation of the ground state. Then if psi is some approximation of the ground state, this is some approximation to the energy, and it's certainly going to be greater than or equal to the ground state, the true ground state energy, just because the ground state is the state of lowest energy. What's cool, though, is that there's a... As you might expect, you might expect that the variation of H will be zero when you're at the minimum. That's the way we find the minimum in ordinary calculus, is we differentiate and set the derivative equal to zero. So to find the ground state, that's what we want to do. The interesting thing is that if we have some state psi, such that any variation of psi gives zero for the change in the mean value of H, then psi actually is an eigenstate. And so to see that, let's just write this equation slightly differently. Let's write it as psi psi. I can't resist the pun. Let me call this H bar. It's equal to psi H psi. All right. Now, what's the change in this? Well, the change in both sides will be, first of all, variation in H bar times psi psi plus variation in psi psi plus psi variation of psi is then going to be equal to variation of psi H psi plus psi H variation of psi. So that's our equation for this variation. And so now we'll say psi psi variation of H bar will equal, and now I want to move these things to the You're missing an H bar coefficient. Thank you. I was looking for it. There. I really wanted it. Normally one gets trouble only for answering questions, but sometimes Oh, and I forgot to give you guys the catch. Okay. So now what does this equation look like? It looks a lot better now. Now what we've got is variation psi H minus H bar psi plus psi H minus H bar variation of psi. Okay. And so if the variation of H bar is equal to zero for all changes in psi, then what do we get? We have zero is equal to variation psi H minus H bar psi plus psi H minus H bar variation of psi. And now we can say even for variation of psi equal epsilon psi itself. And in that case we get zero is equal to psi H minus H bar psi. And that means that that psi H psi is equal to H bar. And so psi has 
the mean value that's equal to the lowest possible value, namely T0. And so if the ground state is not degenerate, psi is the ground state. If the ground state is degenerate, then psi is one of the states in the ground state, one of the possible degenerate vectors in the ground state, a linear combination. So that is the essence of the variational method. It's not all that... It's, in fact, extremely simple. So what you do... What you do, though, is, as I said, in the case of the central potential, it's almost as much art as science. That is to say, if you have a given problem, you have to... And you want to use the variational method. You have to think very hard as to what the ground state probably looks like. And then you write your ground state wave function. Suppose it's a function of x. In terms of a number of parameters, alpha, beta, and so forth. Let me take two parameters, say. And so you might say it's a normalization factor, which, of course, is defined in the usual way. And then you might say, well, this thing is going to be e to the minus alpha times the absolute value of x, because the thing is spherically symmetric. And then you might say, well, because the thing is attractive but repulsive at the origin, maybe it has an x to the beta at the origin. So I'm just completely guessing. I'm just giving this as a pure example. But in other words, you choose a certain form, and then you would compute what... You would compute h bar, which would be then the mean value here in this state as a function of psi. Maybe I should just say it's a function of alpha and beta. H, alpha, beta, we'll call this the state. x, alpha, beta. And then you divide by the norm, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. Or if it's normalized, you don't have to divide by the norm. And so you compute this thing, and this will give you a function of alpha and beta. Then what you do is you say 0 equals partial h bar, partial alpha. 0 equals partial h bar, partial beta. And so you then solve for alpha and beta. And then once you have alpha and beta, you compute h bar, and that's your guess as to what the energy is. And your function psi of x, psi x of alpha and beta is then your guess as to the wave function. And sometimes this works very well. Sometimes it doesn't. In fact, one example where it does work pretty well, why don't I use that blackboard over there just to, I think I can do this example without using the notes. So let's suppose we wanted to estimate the ground state, let's see, the ground state energy of hydrogen. And here, so this is a combination of variational principle with the uncertainty principle. So what would you expect h bar to be? Well, it's going to be p squared over 2m minus e squared over r. And you're going to want to have r and p. So this is sort of a, this is not quite the variational method, but it's worth seeing anyway. You want r and p, and you want 
You want actually um, you want R and P to be as small as possible. On the other hand, R P has to be of the order of H bar. And um, so you get H bar is, let us say, P squared over 2M and um, P over H bar then is 1 over R. And so this is minus E squared over R is minus E squared P over H bar. And now we differentiate with respect to P. And um, what we get here is P over M uh, minus E over H bar. Check the math, okay. So that gives us P is equal to M E over H bar. And now this energy then is M E over H bar squared over 2M minus E squared 1 over R, 1 over R is P over H bar, and P over H bar is M E over H bar squared. And then at the bottom, you need P over M minus E squared over H bar, right? Where? The last equation. Oh, E squared. Good. E squared. Good. I would have been looking for that. <laughs> All right, so what is this? This thing is um, M over 2 e to the fourth over h bar squared minus m e to the fourth over h bar squared. So altogether, this is minus m over 2 e to the fourth over h bar squared. And if we change things a little bit, throw in c squared, we get minus m c squared minus a half m c squared times um, uh, e to the fourth over h bar squared, c squared. This quantity here is alpha squared, namely 1 over 137 squared. And this turns out to be the exact correct answer, minus a half mc squared, alpha squared, for the ground state of hydrogen. So this, this was sort of a combination of the uncertainty principle and the variational method, but it it has something uh, of the two. Now, of course, the fact that we got exactly the right answer was um, using the uncertainty principle and the variation principle is um, luck. Um, normally, what you expect to get is if you, if you um, use the straight variational principle and um, and one parameter, and you don't work very hard. You expect to get you expect to do better than an order of magnitude. And if you work pretty hard at it, you might get 20% accuracy, 10 or 20% accuracy. And if you put in more parameters, then you start getting better and better uh, accuracy. All right, let's switch now to um, to uh, helium. And um, of course, one way to do helium is to invent a central potential that's appropriate, but um, that really doesn't work so well with helium because um, there are only two electrons. And so, it's, so the procedure I'm going to follow is one that's um, works pretty well, but doesn't involve the central potential. And in fact, this this calculation, we're not going to finish it today, but we will finish it on Wednesday. This um, calculation um, played an historical role in the adoption of quantum mechanics. Um, 
Because you see, when, when Heisenberg and Schrodinger produced their matrix and wave mechanics and got really nice, uh, essentially, to order alpha squared exact answers for the uh, uh, hydrogen atom uh, energy levels, all the energy levels. Um, well, that was great, but on the other hand, Bohr had already gotten essentially the same numbers with his sort of magical mystery tour rules. And um, so people weren't sure whether quantum mechanics was, was actually right. I don't think it was in the state of string theory, the string theory is now, but um, couldn't resist. But, um, but um, it wasn't nailed down. On the other hand, by 1927, um, some people had done some very nice calculations of um, the helium atom and had gotten the ground state energy to uh, a few percent. And um, what they used in particular was the variational method. So this will be an application of um, both of the identical particles idea and the uh, variation principle idea, as well as the perturbation theory and everything else. So what's the Hamiltonian? Well, clearly it can be P1 squared over 2m e plus P2 squared over 2m. So these are the two electrons. Minus 2e squared over r1 minus 2e squared over r2. 2 because we're talking helium. And then the killer term, e squared over r12 plus r12 is r1 minus r2. So that's the Hamiltonian. And um, if we have a Hamiltonian where, um, say, well, let me just give you the, <coughs> the expression here. If we take this to be the perturbation, which is the thing I said not to do in the case of a multi-electron ion, but you more or less get away with it in the case of helium. Well, you can solve this part because this will just be, this is just two hydrogen atom terms with Z change. And so you can take this to be X1 psi NLM of X2 plus or minus uh, psi 100 zero zero X2 psi NLM X1. And notice what we're doing here. This is the space wave function. First of all, let me observe, in this Hamiltonian here, there's no spin. But even though there's no spin, there's going to be a huge effect of spin because the particles are identical. And so, the particles being identical, the thing has to be totally anti-symmetric. And so, if we're in the triplet state, then the space wave function has to be anti-symmetric. So this is the case where the spin wave function is, um, I should say, 1m. And this one is the case where the spin wave function is 0, 0. So if the spin wave function is anti-symmetric, then the space wave function has to be symmetric, and this gives you the this gives you the thing symmetric, and so the thing is anti-symmetric. If, on the other hand, the spin wave function is symmetric, then we need the space wave function to be anti-symmetric. So according to whether the spin is um, singlet or triplet, the space wave function is either uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric, and um, the sentence was too long for me to associate which one of which All right. Now, what is this? I, we, we really ought to uh, stop in a second, but let me just write down. Suppose we're in the, um, suppose we're trying to find the ground state of the medium. Well, then, 
what we would have, and this would be pi, if they're both going to be in the ground state, then we um, can't have the minus sign, so we have to have the single state. So we have 0, 0. In this case, this thing is z cubed over pi a0 cubed e to the minus z r1 plus r2 over a0 times 0, 0. So that's our approximation for the ground state. And um, uh, it's space symmetric and spin anti-symmetric. Z is equal to 2, but of course what we can do later on is have Z be a variational parameter. Okay, now what do you get as the, the um, energy? Well, the energy here then is 2 times um, 4 times minus e squared over 2a0. The 2 comes because we have two electrons. 4 is equal to z squared, z being 2. And this doesn't. This gives you a reasonable answer. It's 8 times the uh, times 13.6. It's 2 negative by about 30 percent. So this is this is off by 30 percent. But of course, this isn't even doing perturbation theory. This is leaving out this last term completely. If you put in the last term, which we'll do on Wednesday, you get a better answer. And um, let me see. You get an answer that's not bad at all. It's off by about 6% as opposed to 30%. And then you apply the variational method and you, you zoom in on something that's, um, let me see, it's uh, off by about 2%. And so when and that, that calculation was done then. And when people saw that they could get ground state of helium to within 2% with uh, a very solid calculation and a rather simple calculation, um, uh, they, uh, they said, well, this quantum mechanics is for real. It's not just um, a bunch of mag magical rules. All right, so Wednesday we'll finish up helium. And uh, do, I guess, uh, something else.